All right. Hi, Tim. Hi, John. We did a long conversation on the theme of trees in the Bible. Yep. And we're going to look at a few questions that came in and respond to them. Yeah, absolutely. You picked them out? Yes. I did pick them out. Um, Thank you, everybody. We got so many great questions uh, from the audience. So thank you. Um, And as always, we can't, you know, pick everybody's, but I try and notice patterns and repetitions and themes. And then I kind of pick representatives from all the different themes. So, and is there, as usual, I've picked out like a dozen. We usually don't only ever talk about like four. We'll see how many we get. Yeah, I may make it speed round today, (laughs) right? I always ask you for speed round. Yeah. And then you you can't do it. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll try. (laughs) Do like, instead of turtle speed round, let's do... Not not rabbit or hare speed, but like something else. What's yeah. in between? Um, I think they call that a brisk jog. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Deal. Deal. So just a quick recap is yes. um, trees in the Bible, uh, it, we can't go over everything. Yeah. But the story of the Bible begins with this cosmic tree in the yep. center of a garden yep. that's God's eternal life to eat from. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we just trace this theme of trees and next to that tree yeah. is another tree which we're forbidden to eat from. That's right. Rep- represents a choice yeah. that uh, is before God's human partners of whether they're going to do what's good in their eyes or choose wisdom, which is to fear God and obey his commandments. I think that's enough of a setup if you're not following along already with, yeah. the, with the theme. So let's just jump into the questions. Yeah, deal. Uh, our first question is from Luke in Houston, Texas. You like that? Texas. <laughs> Good work. <Tim. laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, no offense, Luke. Okay, Luke, you ask, if the tree of the knowledge of good and evil places the option before humans of either receiving wisdom from God on his terms and his way or reinventing good and evil for themselves in a way that's beneficial for them but dangerous for others, what does it mean practically to make that decision for yourself? How do biblical characters navigate this question, and how can we do that today? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's get practical. Start by getting real. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, this is, you know, as much as I enjoy tracing design patterns and how the biblical story works and hyperlinks and the imagery, um, it, it, the per- purpose of a story about two characters named human and life. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Uh, facing this choice about good and bad before God. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, this is, this story's been speaking to every single reader of Genesis for millennia now for Mm -hmm. a very good reason. Mm -hmm. It's, it captures the dilemma of my everyday life (laughs) in a very real way. Um, And so I think that's what you're after, Luke. Like what are the ways that our own lives bring us to moments of the choice between two trees? Yeah. What does that mean? Well, and for the um, <clears throat> for the first audience, which was ancient Israel, mm-hmm. I think, isn't this very practically, um, they had a covenant code mm-hmm. by which to uh, be God's people, and they were called to obey it. Mm-hmm. And by obeying that, it's eating of of life. Yeah, that's right. And and there's a blessing that comes with obeying it. Yeah. So very practically for yeah. for them, yeah. not eating of the tree yeah. of my own way of life yeah, that's and right. eating of the tree of life is just following the covenant. Code. Following the terms of the covenant. The terms of the covenant. Yeah, that's right. That's um, right. O- obedience. Yeah. So yeah, what you're drawing attention to is this story. It's about all humans, but it's an introduction to the Hebrew Bible, which mm-hmm. is going to tell the human story by telling one particular family story. Yeah. So family. if you're an ancient Israelite and it's like, yes. what does it mean yeah. to abstain from the tree of knowing good and bad and eat from the tree of life? Yeah, that's it's right. following the Torah. It's follow, yeah. The com- and specifically following, yeah, the wisdom of God's commands mm-hmm. revealed revealed in the Torah. Yeah. So you could say that's a first, uh, first layer of application within the Bible itself. Right. Um, and a- another way this goes actually is through the design patterns of Genesis, where by echoing um, the language of Genesis 3, you're going to see 
Abraham or Sarah or Isaac and Rebecca or Jacob. They're all going to come to these moments in their lives and they're going to do what's good in their eyes in a way that, as you say, Luke, benefits them but disadvantages other people. Um, so I, I think part of what uh, the, the tree imagery is so potent is because it can become an icon for almost like any uh, scenario where I find myself in where uh, I have a choice to make. Um, and there, we've talked about this before. There are some choices that I make that I'm, I choose willful ignorance and mm. willful selfishness. Mm. And usually it's only clear to me after the fact <laughs> that that's what I was doing. Um, but then there are also some scenarios where I actually just, I make a choice and it turns out that it was just, you know, a poor choice. And you it, didn't understand all the variables, but I didn't know the variables and it was, you know, un, unintended, uh, harm done to myself and other people. And that's just what it means to be a human. Yeah. <laughs> um, to me, a huge, uh, light bulb moment for understanding the significance of how I face my own decisions at the tree was actually the wisdom literature uh, conversation that we had hmm. um, in the How to Read the Bible series. Because in a way, the book of Proverbs picks all of the language up from the Eden story. Remember this? Mm -hmm. um, where Lady Wisdom says, she is the tree of life. Come and eat from me. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I was just thinking about this the other day. Here, I, I wanted to show this to you because I do think this is cool. Um, you remember how in Proverbs 1 through 9, Mm -hmm. begins with all the speeches from Solomon to the seed of David. And he um, is recommending the fear of the Lord that is the very beginning of wisdom. That's from like opening paragraph of the book. So um, there's this speech about lady wisdom that starts in verse 20 of chapter 1 of Proverbs. And there's wisdom. She's like, uh, she's like a sales person roaming in the streets. Proverbs 1, verse 20. She's shouting, lifting her voice in the square. The streets are noisy. There's lots of voices competing for your attention. So it's almost like an image of the tree of knowing good and bad. There's all these trees mm, that you could take from. it looks good. Yeah. And so she says, verse 22, Oh, simple ones, how long will you love being simple-minded? How long will, you, uh, will fools hate knowledge? And so look at verse 23. Turn to my correction. Look, I will pour out my spirit upon you. Hmm. And Ivy says thoughts. Oh, what? Really? Yeah. yeah. I'll pour out my thoughts to you. What? So weird. It's rock. It's ruach. Hmm. I will pour out my spirit on you. Hmm. Come, come, come now. Hmm. So this is wi God's wisdom. Yes. Personified metaphorically right. here. As a woman. That is now being identified with God's spirit being given to someone. Um, and when people receive God's spirit or God's um, wisdom, as you go on into the poems in chapter three, for example, you realize by taking wisdom, you are taking from the tree of life. Right. So the idea of living by God's wisdom, living empowered by God's spirit, um, is all of this is equated with choosing life and not doing what's good in my own eyes. Yeah. So... Sometimes there are commands, do not murder, you know, right. Ten Commandments. This is like what Jesus is after in the Sermon on the Mount. Hmm. Um, so good job. You haven't murdered anybody. But what is the command? What kind of character trait is that command trying to form in me? And mm -hmm. Jesus says it's about contempt. It's addressing issues of contempt and pride and self-aggrandizement that makes me look down and devalue other people. And so... All of a sudden, we're going really deep into issues of character. Um, and that's w one way that the tree of knowing good and bad puts that kind of character choice before me. Mm -hmm. um, so even though the story in the garden is about a divine command about a tree, y you actually have to let the biblical story d deepen the significance mm -hmm. of what mm -hmm. those choices are mm -hmm. in my own life. And even though... For the ancient Israelite, it was about obedience to this covenant command, this covenant commands. Yeah. Um, underneath that is this This is a way for us to live yeah. in God's wisdom. Yeah, that's right. And, yeah. um, and so obedience to God's wisdom is really what, at the heart of, yeah. of eating of the tree of, of life. Of life, yeah. With eating, yeah. 
That's right. Living by God's wisdom is taking hold of the tree of life. And so really a way to, to ask this question then yeah. is how do you practically live by God's wisdom? Yeah, that's right. What's practical wisdom? Yeah. It's a rich it's a rich image mm-hmm. that leaves you with this awe and wonder, but then when you get practical it's like Yeah. Well, how do I eat of that? How do I live by God's wisdom? Yeah, that's right. And then I feel like you're in a conversation about um keeping in how do you live yeah. by God's spirit? Yeah, it becomes way more open-ended. Yeah. Right? Isn't that interesting? A story about a divine command about not to do one thing <laughs> all of a sudden inverts and becomes an open-ended question yes. about how do you how do you become a disciple of Jesus? How do you live by the spirit of God? Yeah. How do you Yeah. keep in step with the spirit? Yeah. These yeah. These questions. Yeah. Uh, by definition, um, the answer to those questions has to be discovered every day, I think. <laughs> <laughs> like you can't make a rule for it. The only the rule for Jesus is love God and love your neighbor. Right. But but you can oh. – it seems like you can train your heart or you can create a, an environment in mm-hmm. which you're ready to be obedient Yeah. W- when – you, when God tells you the thing to do, yeah, or at yeah. least be, be be open to that, yeah, I um, think that's right. That's at least something we can be practically yeah. doing. Yeah, no, I think I think that's uh, this is the function that the laws of the Torah had in the life of Israel. This is the function that the laws of the Torah have as wisdom for followers of Jesus. But then also, you know, like the Sermon on the Mount is um, an introduction to Je- messianic character formation yeah. um, and if I let the values and begin to shape life habits that fit with the values of the ethic of Jesus I will find that I will b- begin to discern more easily the right choice when I have my moments in front of the tree mm-hmm. the trees of choosing yeah it seems yeah. like the most practical prayer is not my <clears throat> will but your will be done yeah that's right it's yeah figuring out how to practice that prayer and mindset i i think so yeah <laughs> which yeah i mean <laughs> that's yeah oh yeah all of a sudden I, I uh <laughs> these are the things that i go to other people to get advice about right? <laughs> yeah. so uh basically luke what we're saying is this is a great question mm. i think the question the only response we can give is uh just pointing to the teachings of jesus and like what does it mean to be faithful to him and, and live by his wisdom. And there you go. Mm. We're in the same boat as you, Luke. Mm-hmm. This next question is from Mitchell. He's from Manhattan, Kansas. Kansas. Got ya. It's uh, a good one, Mitchell. I had a question. <laughs> nice try, Mitchell. <laughs> <laughs> I had a question regarding Genesis 3 after Adam and Eve take of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they realize they're naked and they feel shame. They cover themselves with leaves. And I might be grasping at straws, but what would it mean in the concept of trees for them to be covering themselves with the things that trees are covered with to cover their shame? Yeah. 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 It's like a perceptive question. It is a perceptive question. (laughs) I love it. Yeah, me too. Um, I actually just recently came across the first scholar I've ever seen draw attention to Hmm. that little detail. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, everybody notices uh, they took from a tree and they covered themselves with the leaves of, of a, a tree. Of a tree, fig tree, actually it says. Oh. Um, so, uh, and that's an interesting narrative detail. It's iconic in like yes, the art history. Well, it's hard to draw Adam and Eve without without the leaves. The leaves, <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> uh, but um, so, but you're asking, is there some kind of symbolic connection there? And mm-hmm. I, to be honest, I had never fully thought about it. Um, however, once I had really worked out, and we talked about. It, in, earlier in this podcast, the idea of people as trees as a metaphorical scheme, it did start to just sit there in the text like, huh, they dress themselves up as trees after they break a divine command hmm. regarding a tree. a tree. Yes. Um, so it was a, a, a scholar, Crispin Fletcher Lewis, who we interviewed mm-hmm. a year or so ago. Um, he has done a lot of great work on the nature and origins of apocalyptic literature um, that we talked about, we're going to be working on a video about starting this week. And um, it was a little essay he had on apocalyptic literature and Second Temple Judaism. Anyway, he made a reference to this that I th- all of a sudden I was like, yes, I think that's exactly right. Uh, there's two poems in the book of Psalms 
that are making fun of uh, idols. Um, and Psalm 115 is one of them. And, you know, it's just always good to read a psalm. Yeah? <laughs> yeah? Psalm 115. Not to us, Yahweh. Not to us. But to your name be kavod, glory. Right? W weightiness, significance. Because of your loyal love and because of your faithfulness. That's from Exodus 34, verse mm. 6. Why should the nations say, where is their God? This is, you know, this is Babylon mocking Israel, so to speak. You know, we just tromped on your temple. Yeah, your God's absent. Yeah, where's Yahweh? Why didn't he protect you? Our God is in the skies. He does what he purposes. The idols, on the other hand, are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths. They don't speak. They have eyes. They can't see. They have ears. They don't hear. They have noses. Can't smell. They have hands. They can't feel. They have feet. They cannot walk. They can't even make sounds with their throats. Those who make them will become like them. Hmm. Everyone who trusts in them. Yeah, that's it, some shade. It goes on. <laughs> 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 so yeah, serious trash talk yeah. here. Uh, maybe it lands a little less for people who didn't grow up with shrines and idols everywhere. But right. I didn't. So I didn't either. I have to Im imagine myself into another culture mm -hmm. for this to land for me. Um, so this line, those who make them will become like them. It's, it's repeated in a couple other places in the Hebrew Bible. One is another psalm. And... So the whole thing is saying, listen, um, there's real humans, hmm. right? There's Who humans. are the image of God. Who are the image, exactly. They are the image of God. And image of God humans, well, they have mouths hmm. and they talk. They have ears. It's the whole hmm. list, yeah? Yeah, they have functioning body yeah, parts. totally. So it's like, okay, you tell me. Um, there's the real images of God and then there's the images that the images of God make. And hmm. they can't do any of the stuff that the real images can. <clears throat> And then the last line of that little trash talk is those who images of God who make these idols will start to become less human. Mm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah. So Chris Ben drew attention to this in light. And we talked about this, how in the design patterns of the tree, mm -hmm. um, all through the story of the monarchy, the, the monarchies in Israel, their trees of knowing good and bad are... Um, represented by the idols, uh, the idol trees on high places. Mm -hmm. Like and Asherah poles and such. Yeah, exactly right. Idols represent their failure at their moment of facing the choice of trusting God's wisdom or doing doing my own. Um, so uh, Crispin, this is a long answer to your question, Mitchell. <laughs> uh, uh, but Crispin thinks that this idea that comes out in a number of Psalms is actually being hinted at right there in the Garden of Eden story. Hmm. Um, that those who idolize or deify their own search for wisdom on their own terms um, here in the form of a tree will become like the thing that they idolize. Hmm. So they um, seek the wisdom of God more than honoring God's commands. And so they, they sin at the tree, and then they end up looking like trees. They become like the thing that they've idolized. Yeah. Now... Um, in God, that's, 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 that's good. It is, yeah. God, I think it's good. It is good. I like it. Can I poke a hole in it? Please. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just thinking um, uh, there's good trees and there's bad trees. Yes. And yeah. we're supposed to be like a tree. Yeah. We're supposed to be like the tree of life. Yep. And yeah. Psalm 1. No. Totally. Yeah, yeah, Psalm right. 1? Yeah, Psalm yeah. 1. Yeah. Yeah. That when you, the righteous. Yeah, when you live by God's wisdom. Mm-hmm. You are like a tree planted Correct. by streams of water. Yeah, that's right. So in that way, yeah, yeah. Um, having leaves on you would be yeah. the symbol of a beautiful thing, living correct. by God's wisdom. Yeah, correct. So it re so are you saying then in this example, because they ate from the tree of knowing good and bad, they're becoming like that tree? Yeah, th and correct. It's not, and, that's and the, the wrong kind of tree to that's become right. like. And they end up looking like trees precisely to cover over their shame Uh and the vulnerability that they're now experiencing because they've broken the divine command. Yeah. Um, and so it's a sad, there's happy human trees. And yeah. There's sad human trees. Yeah. Happy face, sad face. 
Uh, and this is a sad face human tree. But it's this interesting inversion where the moment that the humans uh, violate God's command by taking from this tree, the next thing in the narrative is they dress themselves up like trees. <laughs> um, this is a little inversion in the yeah. story. That's a great so, observation. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to keep thinking about it. Um, I just, it is interesting. Uh, it, it's a way of talking about how the humans have, um, it's like they've degraded themselves. Yeah. They are more than trees. Mm. They're like trees, but mm-hmm. they're meant to be more than trees. They're meant to be caretakers of the trees, but mm-hmm. instead they become yeah. like trees mm. themselves. Anyway. All right. Uh, we have a question here about uh, the fruit of the vine from uh, Shannon. In Canada. I have a question in regard to trees, specifically the fruit of the vine. I've noticed that there are a few mentions of the fruit of the vine, one with Noah, who being a husband, uh, he drank the fruit of the vine. Also, the Nazarite vow says that you are not supposed to eat anything of the vine. Also, there was quite a bit of mention about the fruit of the vine as it pertains to the blood of the grapes and how it plays into the New Testament and with communion in the Lord's Supper. I just wanted to get your take on that as it pertains to the topic of trees, especially the fruit of the tree. Mm -hmm. Now, if I remember correctly, um, in Hebrew, (coughs) the word for tree, Hmm. what is that word? Eights. 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 And that... um, we have, in English, we have a word for tree, and we have a word for bush, and uh-huh. we have a word for vine. Yeah. Yeah. In Hebrew, it's all eights, right? Um, no, not necessarily. There okay. are different words um, for different species okay. of trees. Um, more, it's that any of them at any given moment can be called by the most generic umbrella title, tree. Which is eights. Okay. Which is eights. That's so they right. can all be referred to as tree. Yeah. That's we would right. never look at a vine. And refer to it as a tree. I understand. But in yeah, Hebrew, oh yeah, you can. it sounds funny in English, but in um, yeah, that's right. So, uh, the f- in fact, off a common phrase in biblical Hebrew for the vine is "Eitz Hagefen," the tree of the vine, hmm. <laughs> referring to the. Oh, we got one growing in our yard. Mm-hmm. It's like it's thick. Yeah, it's it's tall. It's yeah, like but it doesn't branch out like a tree. It's a grapevine. Right. But it's eights. But yeah, it's eights. It's eights. Um, so the fruit of the eights which can go a lot of different ways. Um, I, yeah, I'm still working on this, but I, I've got a pretty, com- at least a compelling to me, design pattern list that's just all about stupid things people do when they're drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and Noah's the first one. Huh. Uh, so the humans eat of the tree, and then the, you know that's breaking the divine command. But Noah is the first one who takes the gift of the garden, mm-hmm. um, and he abuses it such that it, you know, makes him stupid. He gets drunk. This is in Genesis 9. And then that's where the shameful thing happens with his son in the tent. Mm-hmm. He exposes himself. Um, so then what you can just follow through is just, you know, do a little theme study on people who get drunk throughout the biblical narrative. And um, it can it can be positive or negative. Wine has kind of like a binary moral value for the hmm. Hebrew Bible authors. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's a gift of the garden, yeah. which means it's good. Genesis 1, hmm. it's good. So Psalm 104 says um, God gives grass to the creatures and makes crops grow out of the ground and vine to give joy to the human heart. Hmm. Psalm 104. Um, but then, you know, the Proverbs will also say wine is a mocker and strong drink is a brawler. <laughs> and uh, it'll it'll make you get into fights and get hurt and then not remember it in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so just like anything that's good, it can be taken one of two ways. So you can follow it through. There's this theme of um, people in the high place or in the sacred space who get drunk and do something stupid. Um, do you know that strange story? In Leviticus, about Aaron's two sons who get roasted by the divine fire. Mm-hmm. It's that strange story. Um, so, with the weird offering they make y- or something. Yeah, it says they have strange fire okay. or unauthorized fire. Okay. Um, and that's a whole rabbit hole. But when God's following up on it, right after their bodies, toasted bodies, get carried out of the holy place, uh-huh. the first thing God says is, "Hey, don't ever get drunk before you come into the tent." Oh, really? Yes. So they were drunk. So in Leviticus 10, it doesn't say they were drunk. <laughs> it says that these two guys walked into the tent. 
got roasted for some reason that's not fully clear. Yeah. The first thing God says after their bodies are carried out is, you guys, don't get drunk when you enter into the tent. It's brilliant. Why is that brilliant? <laughs> well, I, in other words, it doesn't say that they were drunk. Yeah. But it, it implies it. It infers it. Yeah. Um, and so then... I didn't is, realize that. Yeah, it's really interesting. And then when you get to the place in Leviticus where it talks about what the priests or the higher level of holiness are called to, one of them is that they're not supposed to drink. Oh. Um, the Nazarite vow that you mentioned, Shannon, is what happens when your average Israelite wants to take on the ultra set apart life of a priest. Hmm. That's, a Nazarite is a normal, it's a non line of Aaron, but you want to live like you're a priest, basically. Yeah. And so Samson was famously one of these. And he, he broke every one of his, <laughs> <laughs> his vows. And actually, he's an important uh, figure in this design pattern where um, it's precisely a strong drink that is constantly bringing mm. him down or the people around him. Hmm. So it's another way that the tree represents a choice for people. Mm. There's all these stories about often leaders who get drunk. And this being the fruit of the vine tree. Correct. Yeah, totally. And so it's one of the ways the Genesis 3 design pattern can get activated is by people abusing alcohol. Wow. And then that's how they make the wrong choice and choose death instead of life. I think it's in Paul's mind when he says, don't don't get oh. drunk on wine, but be filled with spirit. Totally. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly right. Just comparing those two things, like you can be filled with God's spirit, yeah. Yeah. his wisdom. That's right. You can be under the influence of the spirit, in which case you'll have discernment to make wise choices that bring good to you and other people. Yeah. And uh, if, uh, yeah, if your brain's not working right, especially if you caused your brain not to work right, you're just, you're, you're going to hurt yourself or hurt other people or both. And that's yeah. the way of folly. Hmm. Do you want to see something else that's cool? I just noticed this yeah. recently. Um, this is in Proverbs 23. Can, uh, can you pull it up on Gateway on your end? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So think through. Um, the people eat from the tree, Adam and Eve. Violation of divine command, death, exile. Noah drinks of the fruit of the garden. F- folly, exposure, vulnerability, nakedness, shame. So these, are, these stories are parallel in Genesis 1 through 11. Um, in Proverbs 23, there's this sweet little poem um, about alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it starts in verse 29. And it reads, who, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has woe? Were you going to say yeah, about that? Yeah. You're just like, but I think it's a weird thing to say. Is it synonym with sorrow? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Who has like... Who's downtrodden? Who has trouble? Yeah, who has trouble. Okay. Who has trouble? Who has sorrow? Who who gets into fights a lot? Who's complaining? Who ends up constantly getting hurt for no good reason and has... And if he has needless bruises. <laughs> totally. It's MMA <laughs> fighters. Yeah. Who, has who? needless bruises. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who, who's the one whose eyes are red all the time? Mm. Yeah, it's those who love to linger over wine. Mm. Those who especially love the mixed wine, you know, mixing blends. Mm. Right. <laughs> Do not look. Why, why is mixing the wine? <laughs> I think it was a way of making even stronger alcohol oh, okay. content. I, yeah. th- I think. I'm okay. not a winemaker. Um, verse 31. Do not look on wine when it is red, uh, when it sparkles in the cup is New American Standard. Mm-hmm. Literally in Hebrew, when it gives its eye out of the cup. Hmm. So it's as if it's the it's a turn of phrase, meaning it's winking at you. Hmm. It's like you look in there and it sparkles and it's like, come on, yeah. come on, take a drink. It sure goes down smoothly, but verse 32, it will bite you like a nachash, like a snake. Hmm. That wine can be your downfall. It will sting you like a tsiphoni, like a viper. Hmm. Your eyes will start seeing very strange things. Mm -hmm. And your heart will utter distorted things. Hmm. You'll be like somebody laying down in the middle of the sea. Or like someone lying down at the top of a mast. (laughs) Yeah. 
favorite? I think people call those the spins. Yeah, the spins, yeah. Or the, yeah. yeah. Or the feeling of being hungover. Oh, because okay. look at how it concludes. It's, it's now quoting this person who, who drank too much. They hit me, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not hurt. <laughs> <laughs> they beat me, but I, I don't even know anything about it. Yeah. When should I wake up and get another drink? Yeah. That's the poem. But dude, dude, alcohol is like a snake that will bite you and send you into the heart of the sea. Tell me mm. this isn't merging mm. the Genesis 3 Two design patterns, story yeah. and the Noah story. Oh, and the Noah story. I was just thinking the chaotic water story, but or chaotic water theme. Yeah. Yeah. Well, who's, Which is... yeah who's the, the iconic person who, um, you know, was uh, survived through the heart of the sea, you know? Mm. Um, I think what's happening is like this poem about the, the folly of drinking too much. Yeah. Um, but it's using the garden narrative and mm -hmm. the Noah story mm -hmm. and combining the imagery yeah. so that wine is like a snake. Mm. It could be your moment at the tree could be uh, having that second, third or fourth drink. I don't know, whatever that is for somebody. Mm. Um, anyway, I, I thought that was really clever. Yeah, this poem is... Um it's a very perceptive and it's amazing how it feels pretty contemporary still. <laughs> totally. Yeah, totally. <laughs> for how ancient it is. Yeah, that's right. Um, on on abusing alcohol. Yeah, totally. Well. Anyhow, I, I, so there you go, Shannon. You're onto something. There's a thing. Um, oh yes, you also asked about the Lord about uh, the Passover meal. Mm -hmm. So uh, for for sure, that's a key piece. There's all kinds of other things too because wine is red. Mm -hmm. And so it can become an image for blood. Mm -hmm. And so um, the blood of the sacrifices or the wine at a ritual meal can become associated images. Um, so there's lots of wine and blood imagery uh, that goes throughout the Torah and prophets. And, and Jesus is totally tapping into that with uh, the Last Supper. But it all begins with the tree, the fruit of the vine that comes from the tree. Hmm. Well, there's more there I want to think about, but. I at least thought that was cool. Can I ask you a random question about the um, Passover or the Lord's Supper wine? I think, is it Paul quoting Jesus says, whenever you do this, whenever you take this cup, mm. um, do it in this way. Or yeah. It. Or in remembrance of me. Is that the phrase you're thinking of? Or no? Well, no. That's, I think it's a Paul. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it, it, yeah. Jesus says in remembrance of me, G but mm -hmm. but in, the, but there's the phrase whenever you do it. Ah, uh -huh. that's the phrase I want to key in on. Oh, I see. Does Jesus yeah, say yeah. that? Does Paul say that? For as often as you eat this bread, yeah. First Corinthians eleven. First Corinthians eleven. Yeah, that's right. Uh, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Mm -hmm. um, I always thought this meant when you do it in this ritualistic way. Mm. Whenever you do it in this ritualistic way, mm. then you're eating. And drinking of the uh, of Christ, mm. um, and and I was taking communion with a friend, and mm. he said what, he made this point point of maybe it means um, whenever you eat bread and drink wine ever, you do it in oh. rem in oh, remembrance. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. Is there is there a clue to which one it is? Yeah, you know it's interesting actually that um, little phrase. Um, in Paul's account of it yeah. um, is unique to Paul's retelling of it whenever you drink of it. Um, that little phrase is not present in the gospel account. Okay. I'm just looking. It's not in Luke's account. In Luke's account, he just says, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Mm -hmm. That's all he says in Luke. Mm. Um, here, let me look up the... In Matthew 26, he says, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for you. I won't drink of the fruit of the vine until the day I drink it anew with you in, the, in my father's kingdom. So in other words, what it looks like Paul's done there is he's assuming that the thing that Jesus did the night before he was executed has now become a weekly rhythm. Mm -hmm. And so he adds that little phrase, whenever you drink of it. Mm -hmm. Which by which I think he means in the in uh, the weekly gathering. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, so I guess I'm disagreeing with your friend. Okay. <laughs> well, no, no, that's helpful. Well, because <laughs> if it did happen to me, mean, if it did happen to me, whenever you do it, it's I this understand. idea of like, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, when I'm drinking wine, I'm doing, I'm drinking it not to get drunk, uh, not, but to, but, but because it is from God and it symbolizes something. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, God sacrifice, Jesus yeah. sacrifice. Um, and uh, and it's it's a way to, you know, you said in the in the Bible the way that you come to wine yeah. or alcohol. Yeah. Um, there's two different. Two yeah, different two ways. different ways. It, um, can, it can gladden your heart, <laughs> and be a gift of God because it tastes amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it can also destroy you, like most good things in life. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, but it's probably just talking about oh, the I, weekly gap. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I kind of rained on your praise. No, right it's there, fine. But, yeah. Merrill uh, from Maryland. Merrill from Maryland. That's good alliteration. Uh, has a question. Ah, actually, kind of a bigger question about images of chaos and disorder and order in Genesis one and two. Um, but we've talked about it recently, and I think it. I don't know if we've talked about it on the podcast. So okay. I thought we would hear a question and talk about it. Back when God created the earth and the dome, the rakia, over uh, the earth and separated everything and created order from chaos, does that mean his original creation was chaos and that outside the garden was chaos and inside was order? Or does that mean that the whole place was ordered and when humans got exiled, they brought the curse into creation that they change the order back into chaos. I'm trying to figure out if it was chaotic when they got there or if they brought the chaos with them. So I, um, this, is a, this is a challenge for many readers. Let's first just go to the first sentences of the Bible. Uh, you first have the statement, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And you're like, oh, great. Everything exists now. <laughs> but then the next sentence is, now the earth was formless and void and darkness. Yeah, And so... Uh, people who have the view that that's a linear sequence of actions, that God made a good and ordered world, and either the world that he made was chaotic, verse 2, or somehow for some untold story or reason, the good world of verse 1 got turned into chaos in verse 2. Another way to view it that's very ancient, and that actually I think is the most compelling view because it fits with the literary design, is that the first sentence is a heading that's referring to everything that's about to happen and that the real narrative begins in verse 2. Yeah. If that's the case, then the story begins with non-order, mm -hmm. uh, of which the, the narrative images are uh, darkness and a watery chaos. So on that reading, um, the waters and the darkness represent the uncreated world. Yeah. Or unordered world. The non-ordered world, which uh, for the biblical authors to be ordered was to be created. So this is where we kind of have to adjust our yeah. sense of reality to the ancient biblical authors' imagination. But then this has implications for how you go on and view the relationship of Eden and the garden to the rest of the dry land. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't tell if you had a thought on that first point. I well, I think just that that then in the and then in Genesis two, so if Genesis one sets up this idea that creation creation, the cosmos was unordered, yeah, and chaotic. Yeah, God comes, He speaks into it, creates order. That's right. By separating it, light, by from separating dark, things, waters, putting them waters. in their place. That's right. Creating a place for humans. Yeah. Creating a place for everything. Dry land out of the waters. The yeah. whole thing. Yeah. Um, then you get to Genesis 2, and you get the same sort of feeling when you've got this real, like, this desert. It begins with a, yeah, a lifeless. A lifeless desert, desert. Yeah. which in a way is a way to think about yeah. chaos, unordered. Non-order. Yeah. Yeah, non-order. There's no, there's no life there. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. And then God creates a place. He separates out a place yeah. Yeah. where there is order. By providing water. By providing water. He provides water yeah. first. Yeah. And waters the ground and then ground. makes yeah. humans. Yeah. Um, and so I think her question is mm -hmm. then, mm -hmm. 
So, so the, the narrative image about when God plants the garden and the trees is really key. This mm-hmm. is in Genesis 2. So it begins by saying, yeah, there's no plants, no farming, no humans. But there, God did provide water. Mm. And so then you get clay. And then it says um, God formed a human. And then God planted a garden in Eden. So it assumes you got the dry land. Mm-hmm. Then you have a place called Eden. Mm-hmm. Then you have the garden. And then you're told the tree of life is in the middle of the garden. And then God takes the human out of out here and puts him in the garden. Yeah. That's the n- narrative sequence. You can just yes. go read it. In the God's yeah. the holy place, the so, temple. That's right. So, Meryl, you're, I think your intuition is right. Um, humans are taken out of the, the realm of d- dust and dirt and mortality and non-order and put into the realm of order and life. Do you remember uh, one regret you had in all of our videos? Yes, yes. Is in this video called The Messiah. Yep, yep. And we have an image of the Garden of Eden yeah. becoming, um, well, corrupting, I suppose. Yeah, it's like a shockwave goes out from the tree of knowing good and bad. Yeah. So Adam and Eve, they take of the tree yeah. of the knowledge of good and evil. And then the shockwave comes, and then all this desolation in its wake. It turns the garden into a desert. It turns the garden into a desert, and then everything kind of... Like, yeah. And, yeah. Um, and yeah, so yeah. You, you were like, oh, no, actually, that's not a great image. Yeah. Well, it's not the image of the story. The image of the story is that they are driven out yeah. of the ordered garden land, back out into the realm of non-order, right. wilderness, hmm. thorns and thistles and death. And so Meryl's yeah. question is... I. So when when the humans got exiled, mm-hmm. did they bring the curse out into this beautiful ordered creation? Mm-hmm. Um, and right. they changed the order back into chaos. And so what I'm hearing is actually no, out there was was chaos, and, right? And yeah, disorder, that's right. And, and they I were just the, put back into th- it. Th- that's right. And the implication of the commission of Genesis one is be fruitful and multiply, fill the land. Yeah. So God, it's as if Eden is like an outpost yeah. of heaven mm. on earth. And the whole point is that it will sp- spread. Mm. Um, but what happens instead is, be- is the key agents that God placed in his presence to, to begin that process are compromised. Mm. And so he exiles them yeah. out into the land of, of wilderness and death. So uh, it, it's a way of thinking about the human condition as we know that we're made for more. We are the image of God, yet the environment, the, the, the earth that I experience is like a compromised version of what I know it's capable of being. And even more so, I know that I'm a compromised version of what I'm capable of being. And then the whole story arc of the Bible then is about God uh, reuniting heaven and earth. We made a video about it. Which is why garden imagery is so, and tree imagery is so connected to Jesus because he becomes this new bridge between heaven and earth to bring and restore the tree of life back to people. At least I think so. Uh, so I hope I hope that brings some clarity, Meryl. It's somehow it's taken me a long time to get clear about that whole sequence. It now it seems so simple because it's right there, but mm-hmm. my head was full of other ideas about what the curse was and I don't know, other stuff. And it made the dif- made it difficult for me to read the biblical story. So in Genesis 2, then, if the idea is God created order mm-hmm. in Eden, in the yeah. center of Eden, yeah. then the humans are placed outside. It seems like logically they're placed out into mm-hmm. an unordered yeah. uh, creation. Yeah, actually... Uh, this is important for Genesis 4. They actually don't go outside of Eden. They they're don't leave con- Eden. They just go outside the garden. Oh. We're, we're told that oh. they're sent to the east of the garden. Okay. It's Cain who leaves Eden. Oh, interesting. So they're exiled from the garden. Yeah. But then they're hanging out right there. At the gate. At the door. Yeah. Uh, which is where Cain and Abel are offering their sacrifices. Mm. But then it's Cain that's exiled from Eden. And that's why he says, listen, you're making me a wanderer out there. And uh, whoever finds me will kill me. So once he leaves uh, Eden, out there, it's the realm of death and danger. And there's people out there who are going to kill him. <laughs> He's afraid of. That's a whole other 
That's a whole other topic. Yeah. But so Cain recognizes that once he leaves Eden, he's going out into the realm of danger and death and mortality. It's interesting. Mm. And outside of the garden, even in Eden, is still mortality. I think what's strange about the way we're talking about this is what you're saying is something can exist without God having ordered it. Oh, Um, I see. And... Ah, ah. Mm, Well... It's just a different frame of reference. In Genesis 1, you have, it's the, cos- it's the cosmos as a sacred space. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the seven-day scheme. And so the dry land is just one big sacred space, so mm. to speak. Genesis 2 comes in, and um, it's almost more helpful to think of it now as going over the land from a vertical point of view, because it's concerned about the central space of God's life and presence that's meant to fill all of the dry land. Mm. Um, but, but the dry land wouldn't even be there, Okay. a la Genesis 1, if, yeah. that, if it wasn't ordered. But it's still not yet um, colonized with the life of heaven, Okay. which I think is what the humans then are supposed to be going to do. Mm. I, I think that's how the, the logic of the, those two narratives work. Okay. <laughs> what, what do you think about that? Well, I'm wondering if behind her question, there's um, in the tradition I grew up in, there is this um, uh, creation was corrupted mm. with that original sin. Ah, and so, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, was it that everything was good inside and outside the garden? Mm-hmm. And then because of what the humans decided to do, it became corrupted. Right. Or was it that just in the garden it was good? Yeah. Um, outside was just unexplored, yeah. not good yet. Not yet ordered. Not yeah. yet ordered. Correct. We're commissioned to participate with God to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, by extending the boundaries of Eden. Yep, that's right. Or of the garden within Eden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's right. Um, yeah. And so when we we decide not to do that and we're placed outside the garden, mm-hmm. is it that now... Mm. We've corrupted mm. the space, mm. Mm. Um, mm. or is it we've just missed an opportunity? Yeah. How would you describe it? Yeah, yeah. In, in other words, the, uh, the narrative. You got to pay attention to all the details in the narrative. Um, it doesn't say that all creation was the garden or all creation was paradise. Um, it very clearly marks off one area as the region of delight, mm-hmm. which is the Hebrew word Eden. And it says, within delight, God planted a garden. And then even that has a kind of tear to it because the center is marked out as the special spot. So humans are created out here in the du- in the dust, mm. which is the most common biblical image for human mortality and frailty. Du- right, dust. It's uh, Job says it, Abraham says it. So humans are taken out of the realm of frailty and mortality put into the realm of eternal life and given a responsibility and an and a opportunity that they forfeit and are exiled back out into the into the d- disordered land. Hmm. Um, so yeah, it's But even more, that disordered land according to Genesis 1 yes, is, is an ordered su- is space sustained by, sustained by God's God. cosmic ordering. Okay. Uh, but it's not space that is permeated with the life and abundance of uh, the heavens. Got it which is what the garden is. Uh, okay. Um, so, yeah, it, uh, it's not paradise lost. That's mm. not the story of Genesis mm. 2 and 3. It's about paradise. This is a phrase from John Walton's uh, book. It's paradise ungained hmm. or paradise forfeited. Hmm. And that's why the initiative lay in God's cart. Wait, what's the difference between losing something and forfeiting something? Oh, well, it's, uh, if your idea is everything was paradise, ah. humans sinned, and now there was like a cosmic shockwave that turned the whole thing into a desert. Right. That's not, that's not actually the, how the story works. Got it. It's like one spot was colonized with the life of heaven. The life of heaven. Humans were put into it, and they forfeited their opportunity to stay there, and so they were exiled from it. That's how the story works. That's great. Can I say it one time just to make sure I got it? Yeah, totally. Genesis 1, <laughs> God orders the cosmos yeah. as a sacred place. And in it, in that ordering, is the dry land mm-hmm. separated from the chaos waters mm. and um, for humans to flourish. 
and then you get to Genesis 2, and then God creates a hot spot of that land. Mm -hmm. That land is good, Hmm. but it isn't yet... Hmm. It isn't yet God's throne room, or it isn't mm. yet... Um, it's not yet the place where the ideal of Genesis 1 can be reached, which is God and humans, fruitful, multiply, image of God forever and ever. So and the ever. land is good in that it was separated from the chaotic waters. Yeah. But it was yeah. not yet the ideal yeah. of yeah. where God and humans Correct. live together yep. in eternal life. Yeah. But God creates a spot yeah. of that ideal yeah. and then commissions, puts the humans in it, commissions them to extend that to all the land we forfeit that opportunity go out into the land that hasn't Mm -hmm. been developed that way Mm -hmm. yeah that's right and it's uh dangerous out there Hmm. because there's people that'll kill you or there's animals that'll kill you or the ground will kill you slowly and out there we're talking about (laughs) here we're talking about yeah the world yeah the world as we know it Outside of the garden. But this world, as we know it, is God's good creation, too. Yeah, exactly. In the Genesis 1 sense. In the Genesis 1 sense. That's right. It's not yet in the Genesis 2 garden. Per, per, uh, That's when God's kingdom is fully realized, That's when right. heaven and earth That's right. are overlapped. That's why Genesis 2, excuse me, that's why the last pages of the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22, s- specifically pick up the garden imagery and apply it to the new creation because mm. it's the moment when that thing that was forfeited finally becomes reality yeah uh, which is about heaven coming t- to earth the reunion of heaven and earth mm. um i don't know how long we've been gone we've uh been, 55 minutes i love it <laughs> we've gotten through four questions <laughs> it's just like i predicted <laughs> um speed round speed round you want to do it <laughs> <laughs> all right uh elena from bulgaria hmm. Or is it Elena? Ooh, could be Elena from Bulgaria. Forgive us, Elena, Elena. We'll find out in one second. In Genesis twenty-one thirty-three, after resolving an issue about a well with Abimelech, Abraham plants a tamarisk tree in Beth, uh, Beth Sheva, Be'er Sheva, uh, by a well. Is there any significance to the fact that he doesn't build an altar but plants a tree? And then specifically this type of tamarisk tree yes for very perceptive it's wonderful wonderful perception um do you remember how we talked about in this podcast series how the story of abraham being called out of his place in the east to go to canaan uh and then he goes the first place he goes is high places and builds altars Mm. and calls on the name of the lord Mm -hmm. genesis 12 or he goes and he um, sits under a tree mm. and meets with God and calls on the name of the Lord. Mm-hmm. That's Genesis 12. And then um, in Genesis 22, God says, hey, get yourself going up to the mountain. Where it's the story about him and Isaac. So we talked about these two stories. Um, what's interesting, the last sentence before God tests Abraham um, is the um, sentence that you're bringing up. Elena or Elena. And um, what happens is that Abram solves, uh, Abraham solves a conflict with this foreign king. And to celebrate, he calls on the name of the Lord, which he usually does. But every time he's called on the name of the Lord, before this point in Genesis 12 and 13, he builds an altar and he calls on the name of the Lord. In this story, he plants a tree and then calls on the name of the Lord. Hmm. And I think it's a design pattern that's giving you this bigger picture that building an altar is in effect an equivalent of planting a sacred tree (laughs) because they are both places where God and humans commune together. Mm. Uh, This one and offering. Two images, two two ways to think about it. Yeah, one is of a human offering up to God what is most precious. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, and the other is a tree, and trees are where God provides for humans. Mm. Uh, and a tree is where we choose to yeah. obey. Correct. Which, and Exactly. We, which is a form of sacrifice. Totally. We, and so the point is that th- we're told that Abram plants a tree and calls on the name of the Lord. The next sentence is, and after these things, God tested Abram mm. and said to him, 
And then he says, go to Mount Moriah and offer up your son. Well, where's Abraham sitting? Is he? He's sitting by a tree. Oh, yeah. So he's, he faces he's at a his tree t- facing a test. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Exactly. So all of the, all of the moments where Abraham is by a tree mm. fit into these Genesis 3 design patterns mm. in uh, really cool ways. Not, and not just cool because it's artsy, but it's, it's trying to show you that this is going to be Abraham's ultimate test of whether he's going to listen to the voice of God or listen or do what's good in his own eyes. Yeah. Which, yeah, anyway. Hmm. Uh, so gold star, mm-hmm. Lena, uh, yeah. for noticing that. Darren from Washington, mm-hmm. D.C., Washington State. I don't know. I don't know either. My question has to do with the humans are trees idea. Great. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. Oh, well, humans is trees. Hum- that's specific. Yes. Okay. Yes. Ever since watching Tim's Year of Torah videos on Deuteronomy 2019, um, uh, which the Year of the Torah videos, yeah. those are somewhere on YouTube. Yeah, they're out there. They're out there. <laughs> they're out there. <laughs> There's three years of Wednesday mornings at 6 a.m. Yeah. We I remember just, you were doing that. We were first starting this We were working project. on our first scripts for and like you, Genesis. Yeah. And, and I always thought, maybe I'll get up and yeah. never did. Never did. No. Yeah, it's too it early. was awesome. Just three years. Of going through the Torah chapter by chapter every Wednesday. But man, I was And someone always, recorded it, and you can find so it. Tired. Oh, there you go. So we went through the book of Deuteronomy, and Deuteronomy 20, verse 19 has intrigued you, Darren. Do you think the biblical authors are making a pun that is riffing off the humans as <laughs> trees theme in Deuteronomy 20, verse 19? Where yeah. is that? Dude, this is such an awesome little... This is awesome. Um, so Deuteronomy 20 is a whole set of wisdom laws that Yahweh gives the people about how to conduct battles. Um, They're going to exist as a nation state. They're going to get into fights with people. So here's how God wants you either to or not to behave. And verse 19 says, let's say you're laying siege to a city for a long time, fighting against it to capture it. Don't destroy the trees by putting an axe to them so that you can eat their fruit. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. For is the tree of the field a human that it should come under siege by you? Only the trees that you know are not fruit trees can you destroy or cut down to make your siege works against the city that's making war with you until it falls. (laughs) Bible. That's a really random law. Yeah. Uh, okay, this is so perfect. But it's a, it's a cool, it's a cool way to do battle, I guess. Like you're not going to destroy something yeah. that's producing fruit. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah, one for sure. One context of this is ancient warfare tactics, where uh, when you besiege a city, the whole point is you wipe out all of the agriculture of the whole region. You're just trying to make life miserable for them inside. Yeah, the so they can never recover yeah. economically. Um, so that's one thing. So God says none of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but notice the notice actually notice f- first of all that it's specifically fruit trees. Right. If it doesn't produce fruit, it's, you know, okay, use it to, you know, build your battering ram or whatever, <laughs> <laughs> your siege tower. But if it's a fruit tree, God, so God's giving a divine command about the fruit tree. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Um, and, and then specifically, the, look at the question at the end of verse 19. Is the tree a human that it should come under siege by you? It's like the fruit tree is given the same dignity and value as a human made in God's image. Is I that th- what's happening? I think that's the logic here. Isn't the logic... Um Look, you're not at war with the trees. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. Because the tree's not a person. You're at war with the people. Ah, uh, I understand. Uh, I, so is the tree the person oh. you're at war with? No, no, no. Yeah, totally. It's a tree. Okay, all right. So, so at least you can say the trees are given a level of dignity. Yeah. They are given they dignity. They are given dignity, that's for sure. And why is it? Because they represent the gift of God, the gift of God's life. Mm, yeah. Because you can cut down trees that don't produce fruit, mm. but don't cut down the fruit trees. Yeah. Why? Well, they they provide. Yeah. For people, mm-hmm. and they provide for animals, mm. um, which is what Genesis 1 says. So, uh, so you're right. I was overstating my case <laughs> that they're given. Uh, but they are given a dignity and a value 
uh, the, it's remarkable. And um, so it doesn't necessarily assume the people as trees metaphorical scheme, but we're, it's close. We're in the ballpark. Hmm. And there's Genesis 3 language all over this. Right. Um, that well, it's one of those <laughs> things where it's like if there was um, out of all of the commands yeah, totally. to have recorded in the yeah. Torah. Yeah, that's right. Of the how many? 500? How many? 613. 613. Or, or 11. Yeah. <laughs> Why this one? Yeah, that's right. Correct. And it seems like there's something here yeah, that's that's right. it's riffing on the tree theme. Correct. That is more than just an, an army tactic. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. This is about um, it's a conception that all, any fruit tree you come across should remind you yeah. of Genesis 2, God's desire to bring the life of the heavens to the earth. And so if you see a tree that gives food freely, liberally, <laughs> don't cut it down. Don't cut it down. It's not a human. You're not at war with the tree. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, your problem isn't with me anyway. All right, speed round. <laughs> Peter from <laughs> Netherlands. I yes. was wondering if there's a connection between trees and high places and highly placed people. Good one. Because in the examples that you gave about people being like trees, it seems that there's always highly placed people involved. And also when someone is making a decision at a high place at a tree, at the high place, it <laughs> seems that these decisions not just affect their own lives, but also the lives of many others. Yes. Leader. It's about leadership. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Or Yeah, that's right. Adam and Eve are royal priests. Hmm. They're portrayed as royal priests. Both the kingly and priestly roles are representative roles. Hmm. Um, uh, and they and their names mean humanity and life. <laughs> uh, so obviously they're representative. Um, yeah, uh, this is how the biblical story works. Mm. All of the key characters represent larger people groups, um, whether it's Abraham or Moses or David or Joshua, uh, but also like Nebuchadnezzar, um, who is like a big tree of life in that dream that he has, mm. right, in the book of Daniel. Yeah. Where he's like a big tree. So uh, um, the way that the Genesis 3 design pattern will work is specifically, uh, but not only, focusing on people in high places. Um, because and By high places, we mean places of leadership? Places of leadership or high social status. Yeah. Uh, because people of any social status or low social status will right. also have their moments of testing. Mm-hmm. Um, and are called to bear fruit. Totally. And to be life yeah. for others. Yeah, that's right. Yes. But how much more so for yeah. people in leadership? C correct. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so a big part of the testing at the tree on the high place motif is that it's often people in leadership positions. Um, but but not only that. Hmm. But that is a le legitimate observation. Um, so, Peter, a fun project would be to just scan through the biblical story and uh, make a list of all of the people who have moments of decisions, tests of their character somewhere in the vicinity of trees or where trees are somewhere in the context. And you'll get quite a long list and then go for a long walk and <laughs> have a cup of tea and think about these things. Should we keep rocking? What should we do? Yeah, sure. We can do one or two more. Garrett yeah. Ten Garrett. Garrett. From Tennessee. Yeah. My question for the Tree of Life podcast is from the Book of Esther. In the Book of Esther, there are gallows set up for Mordecai by the evil character Haman. Uh, the word gallows is, from what I can tell, the only place where it's translated gallows. I think it's interesting that this evil character thinks he's going to do away with the righteous person but instead meets his death on this tree that's translated instead gallows. I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Mm. It's true. The word gallows appears nowhere in the book of Esther. It's the word eights. Mm. It's, it appears uh, four times in this connection here. Mm. Um, what is a gallow? I don't even really know what a gallow is. Gallows. Uh, th for hanging. Oh. I think for hanging. I'm going to look it up. Yeah. It's a, it's a hangman platform. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, so, in other words, um, translations that interpret it as gallows are not just translating, they're also interpreting mm. what the tree. What that tree was. Yeah. Literally, what it says, Haman says is, I'm going to build a high tree 
for Mordecai to be hung upon. It's mm. the word to hang or suspend. Mm. Um, so it actually could refer to a variety of execution practices. Um, this was from John Levinson, a scholar who wrote a commentary on Esther. But I first came across this, and he surveyed like ancient Near Eastern execution techniques. And um, cr uh, crucifixion or hanging was not common in the ancient Persian Empire, but impaling was. Yeah, and so in our Read Scripture video, yeah, yeah, it's a big impaling. Uh, and the New International Version translates the tree as a pole, mm -hmm. and they translate hang as impaled. So gross. Uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's mortifying. Um, <laughs> s but s so what's significant though? Notice, however, it's um, the wicked want to kill the righteous upon a tall tree, an exalted tree. Mm. Um, and what happens is inverted is that, in fact, the wicked is killed upon that high tree that he made to kill the righteous. And there's a whole, I haven't worked this out yet. I know all the texts, but I haven't pondered them enough. There's a whole design pattern theme about people dying on the tree. Mm -hmm. And Jesus' crucifixion is the culmination of that theme. Mm. Um, but there's a bunch of kings in Joshua who get hung on trees. Mm. Um, there's a law. That says Judas hangs himself on a tree. Huh? Judas hangs himself. I don't remember it being on a tree, hmm. but he didn't hang himself, and his guts spill out on the ground. It's a gross scene. It's also gross. Um, then there's a law in Deuteronomy 23 about uh, the one who hangs upon a tree is cursed mm. by God. Right. So these are all connected somehow, in that the death upon the tree hmm. is this very shameful way to die. Hmm. Um, and then it ends up being the way that Jesus dies. So I think the phrase "hung upon the tree" can act, is that it's a almost it's like a phrase that could refer to many different kinds of execution. Mm -hmm. But what's important is the 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 design pattern meaning of that phrase mm. that goes all the way back to the tree that caused death mm. from the from the garden. I think that's how it's all connected. But I haven't worked it out yet. It sounds like a long, interesting conversation. <laughs> yeah, totally. totally. And yeah, it's kind of a gruesome way to end. Okay, la one, let's, one more. let's end on a high note. Okay. Lauren from Dallas, Texas. One tree that pops up is in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, when Jesus sees Nathanael sitting under the fig tree. This has always perplexed me, and I wondered if there is significance that you could elaborate on. Hmm. Uh, do you know the story? Yeah. It's, it's the culmination of the, of the opening chapter of John. Uh, Nathaniel is the last uh, disciple that Jesus calls out of the whole group, Andrews, Simon, uh, and so on, in chapter 1. And uh, he comes up to Nathaniel, Jesus does, this is in verse 47, and he says, Ah, look, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit, no mm -hmm. treachery. Here's the son of Israel who's not treacherous. <laughs> You're giving me blank stares here. Well, uh, I know this from Sunday school because oh. it's just this classic, like, how did, how did you know anything about me? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, um, oh, no, I'm going after something else. Okay. A son of Israel who's not treacherous. <laughs> I feel like you're doing this. You're like, <laughs> I'm not fishing. Please just pick that up, John. Um, totally. Well, who's the most treacherous person in the book of Genesis? A guy named Israel. <laughs> okay. Right? Deceives okay. his blind father, mm. deceives his brother, yeah. deceives his uncle after being deceived by his uncle. Mm. Deceit is the word associated with Israel in the yeah. book of Genesis. Okay. Because it, it, uh, yeah. Jacob. Yeah, well, Jacob, whose name gets changed to Israel because he fights with God. Yeah. Um, so And his name actually is, is a play on the word deceit at all? Uh, it's a play on the word fighting with God. Well, Israel yeah. is. Yeah. Oh, but Jacob means, yeah, heel, heel grabber, heel sneak. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody who trips other people by grabbing them. Yeah. Yeah. Someone, yeah. yeah, trickster. Okay. okay. Trickster. Got it. Jacob means trickster. Jacob means <laughs> trickster. He gets yeah. His name gets changed to one who wrestles with God. Yeah, fights with God. Yeah. Both, yeah, yeah, they're pretty brawly names. And every part of his life is marked by deceit. Oh, okay. 
Jesus is here to begin the renewal of Israel. Mm. And he sees an Israel in whom there is no deceit. Mm. Uh, and so Nathaniel's like, what? How do you know me? Yeah. Uh, I guess and, that's not the point. Yeah, he says, listen, I saw you sitting under the fig tree. This is Jesus the Riddler, the yeah. prophetic Riddler at work here. Yeah, there's a whole network of texts in Micah, uh, Zechariah, uh, and First Kings that talk about the golden age of Solomon or the golden age of messianic kingdom where every Israelite will sit under their own vine and fig tree. Hmm. So both what Jesus is saying is, ah, here's an Israelite who I can begin the renewal movement with. Mm. It's like... He's a picture of, he's, what, of the yeah. things to come. He's a, yeah, a picture of the renewed Israel, mm. for sure. Mm. Uh, and then Jesus goes on, uh, and so Nathaniel's like, whoa, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. Mm. And Jesus is like, oh, you like that thing about the fig tree? <laughs> <laughs> Just wait. Uh, uh, you're going to see greater than that. <laughs> truly, truly, you'll see the skies open. And the messengers of God ascending and descending oh, and that's on the about Son of Man. Jacob. It's about Jacob's dream on the high place of, of Bethel, mm. which is the house of God. You're going to see yeah. God's space coming down yes. yeah. into our space. Yeah, and so that story about Jacob, this trickster in yeah. Genesis 28, what Jacob sees is a stairway uniting heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. And Jesus replays that but makes himself the stairway. You'll s he doesn't say you'll see the angels going oh. up and down on the stairway. Yeah, he says you'll see the angels going up and down on me. Oh, he's the bridge. He's the ta the tabernacle of God has become flesh. The word has become flesh and made a tabernacle among us. Mm. So it's such a great moment because it's it's highlighting probably like half a dozen Hebrew Bible texts, <laughs> and it's doing it all like in this subtle way that it makes me smile. That's why. Yeah. I'm sorry. I was fishing. No, no, that's great. <laughs> well, what's funny is it just gets so flattened out in Sunday school oh, to just the story about, oh, oh, isn't that cute how Jesus knew this guy? Oh, sure. Supernaturally knew this yeah. guy. Well, and that's one part of what's going on, for sure. He's like yeah. a prophet. Yeah. He, can ha he has, you know, supernatural knowledge. But that's not the whole of what's going on here. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of yeah. beautiful things going on there. Yeah. We made it through nine questions. I yeah. think that's the most we've ever done. Yeah. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Good work. Good job, I feel John. like with this theme, <clears throat> we dance around in a lot of different ideas. Mm, that's true. I think yeah. some themes seem to have this really tight unifying huh. thing going on. Yeah. With the tree theme, it seems like there's so much. Yeah. We talked about it's true. sacrifice and obedience. Mm. We talk about mm. um, wisdom and the fear of the Lord. Wisdom and the fear of the Lord. The we talk, Torah. Uh, we're talking about uh, the sacrifice of Jesus and His blood. Mm. Um, mm. And in my mind, I want to create this one concrete sy system yeah. for this theme to live in, and it yeah. feels like yeah. this one doesn't work so well that way. Yeah. I mean, mm. we talked about cursed is the one who dies on a tree. That seems like a whole thing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the one thing we didn't talk about, which oh. um, was asked a number of times or brought up a number of times, was when Jesus heals the, the blind man. Yeah. And he's like, everyone looks like trees. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So what awesome. What's that all about? Yeah. We don't have time. To yeah. Um, <laughs> but anyways, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think what I've appreciated about this theme, hmm. what I've sensed other people appreciate about this theme, is that it is rich hmm. and it gets you to think about so much. Mm-hmm in a fresh perspective mm -hmm. um and in the same way that we open talking about what does it mean to live um mm. to eat from th the tree of life mm -hmm. practically mm -hmm. and as soon as you open that door you're yeah. into this whole world of yeah of of, of a beautiful question yeah. i feel like it does that in all these arenas it yeah. just keeps opening doors for you to contemplate yeah well well said it's almost like a meta type of theme that can hold lots of other sub themes that unite the storyline of the Bible. Yeah. Um, uh, it, to me, this, the tree imagery throughout the Bible has become one of the best ways to show the poetic imagination of the biblical authors mm -hmm. that through the image of a tree, 
they can ignite so many sub themes and ideas and plot twists um, all under the common imagery of a tree that can all of a sudden mean so many things and uh, it's clear that they want they don't want to shut down our imaginations with this tree imagery they want to ignite it mm. which um, to, to me has become a really exciting way yeah. to think about trees thanks for listening along uh I think this is going to go out at the end of the tree mm. series. Mm -hmm. So it means mm. next yeah. week we will be talking about parables. Yeah. yeah, how to read the parables of Jesus. Now that video is already out. Yep. But we haven't released the conversation. So yeah. that'll be next. Yeah. Talking about parables. That's the next series. That was Jesus the Riddler. Jesus he brought it up. the Riddler. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's going to be awesome. Thank you guys for listening to the Bible Project podcast. Uh, thank you for sending in your questions. We love hearing from you. We're so, so grateful uh, for your enthusiasm and your support. Bible Project is a nonprofit animation studio in Portland, Oregon. We make videos and resources that show how the Bible is a unified story that leads to Jesus. Thanks for listening. <laughs>